evening, everyone. Welcome to our panel. I just want to make a few uh, remarks before we get underway. Number one, all the speakers from Canada today will be speaking from the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Nishinibe peoples. And we want to recognize this as their unceded traditional territory and we glad to be welcomed here. The other thing that, uh, of course, we've got a few technical things. It is 2021. And so, and there we go. Uh, just in time, it's an, my uh, opportunity to introduce to you Jennifer Sachs, who is the Director General of the Controlled Substance Directorate of Health Canada. And Jennifer, if you can say, take over. Good morning. Thanks very much for having me. Am I good to just jump right in and um, start? All right. And sorry, between the sessions, I've uh, mixed in things, so logistical, but it's coming right up. All right. All right. Well, to start off with, Canada is very happy to sponsor this side event. Uh, we are also very pleased to be able to do so in partnership with the Community Addictions Peer Support Association, which is a national organization of people affected by substance use disorder. The Government of Canada put forward this important side event to hear from members of our community that we do not typically hear from in the usual context of substance use issues, and that is police service members, and for some it includes their families. They too deal with the same issues as everyone else, including substance use issues. I look forward to hearing from the panelists today and learning more about each of their unique perspectives and experiences regarding stigma and challenges of seeking treatment services. Simply put, stigma matters because it can prevent people who use substances from getting help. Imagine wanting to seek help but feeling like you cannot in fear of being shamed and judged, as well as being faced with the possible job-related repercussions. So instead, you continue to use and suffer in silence. No one should feel this way, but unfortunately, this is the reality for far too many people. Canada believes in providing help to everyone with substance use issues. This is why we have put forward the resolution entitled Ensuring Access to Drug Treatment, Education, Aftercare, Rehabilitation, and Social Reintegration Services for Marginalized Populations. Everyone should have access to get the help that they want. Ces dernières années, le gouvernement du Canada a pris des mesures pour sensibiliser la population et mettre en évidence les moyens de lutter contre la stigmatisation. À ce titre, il a organisé un événement parallèle avec la Commission des stupéfiants, a obtenu un consensus sur notre résolution de 2018 sur la stigmatisation et a plaidé l'emploi d'un langage non stigmatisant dans toutes les résolutions. Nous travaillons également sur la stigmatisation au Canada, Nous avons lancé une campagne nationale de lutte contre la stigmatisation pour informer le public sur ce sujet et donner des pistes que chacun d'entre nous peut suivre pour contribuer à la réduire. Nous avons également financé des organisations qui s'efforcent de réduire la stigmatisation liée à la consommation de substances au Canada. Par ailleurs, nous avons mis en place un conseil consultatif au sein duquel nous nous adressons directement aux personnes consommant ou ayant consommé des substances afin qu'elles nous livrent leurs conseils, leur vie au quotidien, leurs conditions et les impacts de la consommation de substances. De plus, le partenariat de Sécurité publique Canada avec le réseau canadien du savoir policier et le Centre canadien sur les dépendances et l'usage de substances a permis l'élaboration d'un module de form formation sur la sensibilis sensibilisation à la stigmatisation des drogues à l'intention du personnel du maintien de l'ordre canadien afin de lui fournir des outils et du matériel de référence pour soutenir leur interaction avec les consommateurs de substances. Ce module en particulier a été créé à partir des ressources et des témoignages émanant de l'Association communautaire d'entraide par les pairs contre les addictions des personnes consommant ou ayant consommé des substances. In our day-to-day -day lives, all of us can help those with substance use issues by using non-stigmatizing language, listening with compassion and without judgment, and speaking up when we witness discrimination and prejudice. Once again, simply put, stigma matters because it can help prevent people who use substance from getting help. However, we know that ending stigma can do more than just help. It can save lives. Thanks for the opportunity and back to you, Gord. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Well timed. And uh, 
I just want to make a comment here about myself and the other panelists today. None of us are speaking on behalf of our government, and, but we have brought our experiences with us and we do hope and believe our experiences will resonate not only with you as individuals, but also with you as government. And so I was thinking last night, sometimes my boss comes back to visit me and uh, I don't have much choice about it, it just kind of happens. And so I had a lot of chasing dreams last night uh, uh, of me being chased. And so that's something that's happened fairly early in life. And of course, as you can imagine that uh, often the, who's represented in those dreams or nightmares are police figures. And so um, uh, sometimes you, people ask me, how come you're doing this with the police? And I said, well, as it turns out someone was chasing them as well. And so uh, we're in this together. Uh, there's lots of stuff going on in the world that's difficult. And uh, we do bring a message of kindness and compassion for all. That is a great hope. Um, and so people say to me, well, policy, Gorge can't even spell. What are you doing there with all the policy writers, you know? And, uh, and why are you talking about everybody just be nice, you know? What, what's the point in all that? And so I guess I, I think that it's a fundamental condition of our humanity that the reason we have policies, the reason we're developing regulations, it is the intention for us all to experience a safer, healthier life. But if that's our intention, and I truly believe that, then we need to turn our heads sometimes and look at those things and see if we're being successful. And so we raise this issue and have this conversation with you today based on that. We just want to bring you your attention to whether that's being successful or not. And then, uh, uh, of course, technical issues happen. Uh, and so Peter Moser from Belgium uh, can't join us in person today, uh, but we do have a, a short video clip of Peter with a, an important message about him and his family. The brother whom I grew up with developed an addiction in his youth. He didn't choose addiction. It was fun, then it wasn't, and he couldn't stop. That's when I treated him like I was told by society, harshly for what I saw as his choice, not compassionately for his health condition and his compromised ability to choose. He died, I believe, needlessly because of how our society treated him when he got unwell. We have been confused for years that consequences change changes behaviors. The truth of the diagnosis of substance use disorder is most clear. The behavior continues despite the consequences. So a society's insistence of using consequences on people whose mental health diagnosis is based on the lack of a healthy responses to suffering says much about us as a society. In some tragic way, it mirrors the struggle of people with substance use disorder, unable to change their behavior despite negative results. Thanks, and now I'll introduce uh, Diane Goldstein, uh, California retired lieutenant. Diane? You're on, on mute, Diane. Of course, Zoom, right? <laughs> it's always the case. Um, good, good morning from uh, California, where I'm at currently, uh, to everyone who's here. I'm a retired police lieutenant, having spent a career fighting diligently against the war on drugs, or I should say fighting in the war on drugs and now fighting diligently against the war on drugs. But I'm also a... Um, the current executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, an organization of police prosecutors, judges, and other law enforcement officials working to improve the criminal justice system and to end the many failures of the war on drugs. As we know, the war on drugs is not a war on drugs, it's a war on people. Um, I'm here to share with you um, how I turn my grief into advocacy over my brother's own personal struggles with substance use disorder. Uh, what separated my brother and I as we grew up was his 
genetic predisposition that led him to clinical depression, manic behavior, and substance use disorder. Mine led me to law enforcement. But the paths we walked were never too far apart, even in our darkest moments, marked by my career as a police officer. I recognize in spite of my love for him, I failed him as well by stigmatizing his behavior and blaming his substance use disorder, looking at it through my law enforcement lens during a very, very difficult time in our relationship. In a story that's much too long to tell here, I saved my brother's life because I was a police officer, but his life was also destroyed because of the law enforcement. My brother was not an angel. He'd always been a risk taker. Our family always joked about how many times he would visit emergency rooms over a year. But another striking characteristic of his was his sense of fairness and empathy and co compassion for others. Some of my best memories of him are the ones told by his friends from the world um, of um, addiction about how he found personal redemption through saving them, helping them. Uh, and it would result in, in even in some, some aspects, um, consequences for him personally that he was willing to do to ensure that his friends survived. But because of the stigma associated with being dual diagnosed and manic depressive, the good he did was not when it came to the eyes of the law. He was objectified and viewed as less than human by those in charge of administrating the rule of law and even by being a failure to those that loved him, myself, and, and the remainder of my family. I did not know what it meant to be my brother until I opened up my home to him to save him. It was in this intimacy of watching him try to live up to the expect expectations of those he loved where I realized just how damaging our society's tough love moral rhetoric on drugs really is. My brother was a wounded bird, a sensitive soul, a risk taker, and by our society's standards, a criminal. His struggle with substance use disorder taught me many things. He had many years of sobriety interspersed with what most addiction specialists will say are the failures characteristic to everyday disease. But because of an emphasis by our court system on abstinence-only drug programs, these normal and accepted failures in recovery are punished by a system that, that places retribution over progress and harm reduction. Because of his felony convictions for drugs, he was unemployable and thus lacked health care. Without me, my brother would have been in the streets and would have died. Before I knew what harm reduction was, I managed to give my brother what I believe were many happy, happy moments by learning how to destigmatize him. I gave him tools to manage his life, provided structure, stability, work, and unconditional love. But in spite of all that, because of a lack of mental health care and professional medical support, um, his disease reduced him to just another drug addict. And I hate to use that term because it's stigmatizing, but that's exactly how we treated him. We dehumanized him in the view of the cops and the prosecutors. There are many that judge me as enabling my brother's substance use disorder, not helping him live up to the standards of our society but I will argue that if we in fact had a national drug policy in the United States that was based on harm reduction strategies and compassion, that my brother and others like him would not be lost to us or languishing in jail, which for my brother would have been just another form of death. That, as the phone rang that fateful morning when he died, my only relief in my brother's accidental overdose is that he would find the peace that he had sought throughout his life. My brother's death resulted in turning my grief into advocacy and to continue to work to prevent other families from having to experience the stigma and shame associated with substance use disorder. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diane. And uh, we'll hear from Sergeant General Brownrigg from Ottawa. Good day, everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody being here to hear our messages. Um, so I'm a, an active police officer here in Canada. I'm currently in my 19th year of service. Most of my career has been as a frontline patrol officer. 
uh, working in some, on some difficult beats and some difficult areas. I also have a lived experience with a substance use disorder. Um, I grew up in a particularly fractured environment and learned some poor coping mechanisms, uh, long history throughout my family of substance use disorders. And when I went from the frying pan into the fire of a policing career, uh, the stress that I experienced, the trauma I saw, everything started to culminate uh, and got a lot worse. I started to self-medicate and then uh, built a very, very um, poor, poor coping mechanism is the best way that I can put it. Um, so here I am today, I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of things. First thing I'd like to speak about is the stigma, the barrier to care that I felt stigma was as a, as a police officer within my organization, within policing as its own career and the subculture that exists there. Um, and then I'd like to transition into some forward motion and talk about some things that were positive, particularly that my organization did that helped me on my journey to recovery. So to start, how is stigma a barrier to care for me? The first day I, I joined the police and walked into the station, I could feel judgment. Much of it is necessary. The courts will judge our decisions. The media will judge us, the scrutiny of the public. It's necessary. My job is supposed to be hard. We are really tough on each other, really tough on each other. A lot of that's by necessity too. You trust your partners, you're in very difficult situations, life-threatening split-second decisions. So when there's any, when you fail to hit that mark of high competence, high-level decision-making, high-level problem-solving, we judge each other very, very harshly. I remember a senior officer when I first started told me, uh, guard your reputation. Guard that reputation throughout your career because that's all people are gonna know you. If, even if they don't know you, they're, uh, they're gonna have a friend who says, hey, do you know uh, Joe Browner from Ottawa Police? Oh yeah, I don't know him, but I've read his reports. I hear he's a good guy, that kind of thing. So your reputation is everything. So as my career starts to progress and I start to develop some significant mental health issues, I'm really, really hypersensitive to maintaining that you know, posture that I'm in control. Everything's good. I'm competent. I can do this. And it's this seesaw. I find myself in a seesaw now where I'm trying to be, you know, top level, somebody you can rely on. And then I'm coming home and I'm grappling with this really terrible illness. And my family's paying the price, my wife and my children. They're getting a different person. And I'm just seesawing, seesawing. And it's getting worse and worse. And that seesaw is going down the down spiral. Then I get posted to some really difficult beats and I start to see parallels between what's going on with me, the issues that I'm starting to, to develop and then what I'm seeing in the streets. So how do things change? Here's something really important for me. It was very, very, very profound. It was one very respected officer in my police department, senior officer nearing the end of his career. And out of the blue, he goes, we have a public uh, messaging board. Out of the blue, he goes into this very public forum and he says that he's struggling with uh, substance use disorder and he's offering help. And the group is called the Badge of Courage. Badge of Courage. And that really, really resonated with me. We had one of our own stand up and say, I'm not okay, but I'm here to help. Badge of Courage. You know, it's an important term because the courage that it took for him to do that, it brought me in. I saw it and I said, that's it. I have to go with that. And that example that was set that day by that man is one of the reasons that I'm here today speaking to you in a public forum, because I feel that when we break that stigma barrier and we start saying it's okay to not be okay, it makes a profound difference and it opens the door for other people who are questioning anything about themselves and seeking an avenue for help. This transitions into the second part of my, my, uh, my talk here. I'd like to speak about some positive things that we can do just to throw some ideas out there. And again, these are all my own anecdotal experiences, but things that were very, very helpful for me in that initial stage of trying to seek recovery and live a life in recovery. So at the same time that this, this guy puts out this uh, offer of assistance through the Badge of Courage, my organization did a couple of things that were very profound as well. They had brought in a private doctor to run a program for us uh, it was a holistic medical program based on our benefits package. So it explored mental health, physical health, nutrition, everything. It would take you a year to go through it. And you had to commit to the program. It was designed for police officers and it was in conjunction with my police department. Um, so I said, well, okay, we're going for this, right? So I jumped into that as well. Um, 
and I think the important thing with regards to the stigma conversation on that is when an organization commits to wellness initiatives, when an organization says we recognize that the job that you're doing is really, really tough and you might get sick, we know that. This isn't anything new. So we're trying to put some mechanisms in place so that you feel supported and that you have avenues you can go. That breaks the stigma barrier. It's saying it's okay to not be okay. Um, the other things that are important, so in my organization, I actually created a section, it's called the wellness section, and they're responsible for developing programming related to keeping officers healthy. So two of their core programs that they do now is they created a formal peer support group, uh, which is you know actively advertised. You can say, hey, you can reach out to anybody. There's bio biographies of the peer supporters. You reach out and then you'll be assigned a peer supporter, somebody to talk to you. And it's not only available to the officers, it's available to families as well. So police spouses, uh, all that kind of thing. And they do an early intervention program as well, where they, they track officers, not from a punitive perspective, but tracking certain trends that are, you know, potentially alarming, you know, excessive overtime, excessive complaints, those kind of things. And it's not to, to punish the officer, but it's to initiate a conversation through the chain of command to say, hey, is everything okay? So again, they commit to that as an organization. And we all start to think, you know what, it's okay. They have a wellness section. Maybe there's something to this here that this is a really difficult job and it's okay to not be okay. The other thing that I'd like to speak about is training. And in policing, there's so much training. And it's a lot of it feels like a throw in. Well, we have to train you this because it's mandated. We have to train you this because for whatever reason. Um, if you want to do that with wellness, if you want to do that with having your officers look after each other, uh, look after themselves and throw in a little 15 minute presentation here and there, that's fine. But if you have meaningful programming, and I'm talking about conferences, bringing in speakers, notable speakers, um, and full day training where people can sit there and really immerse themselves in this uh, topic and start to really do some self-reflection about looking after each other and looking after themselves, it's important. So I know uh, the RCMP, our National Police uh, Service here in Canada, they brought a notable speaker named Dr. Kevin Gilmartin from the United States. He's a behavioral scientist. He wrote a really profound book called Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, which speaks to how to survive a policing career emotionally and the sort of the damage it's going to do. So they brought him in, did a full day seminar. It was open to police officers and their spouses. My wife and I went to that. And there it is. Things like that where you're, as an organization, committing now to educating your workforce and committing to offering supports and letting everybody know that in this career, this marathon, that's not a sprint. Sometimes it's okay to take a knee. Sometimes it's okay to not be okay. Just settle down and get through it. That's my message today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. And now we've got a, a question for the audience. It won't take very long. It's yes or no. Uh, it'll show up on your screen in just a moment. Of course, I tried to vote, but I'm not allowed to because I'm a panelist. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure everybody knows my answer is yes. We'll find out everybody else's answer in a few more minutes. But uh, we now want to introduce you to uh, former police officer Suzanne Sharkey uh, from North Trent, Umbria, United Kingdom. Suzanne. Hi, thank you. Um, welcome to all, and thank you for taking the time to join this side event online <clears throat> um, and I always find it really hard how best to introduce myself as I've discovered I'm many things and I have many facets but I suppose I'm just another human being <laughs> really trying to work out how to live the best life I can with what I've got so my name is Suzanne Sharkey and I'm a human being um, but I suppose a bit of perspective for those listening in of why I'm here why I advocate um, destigmatizing problematic substance use. So at present, I'm co-executive director of UK LEAP. Um, my previous lives include being a police officer, and I'm also a person in long-term recovery from alcohol and other drugs. And there's a huge space from when I was serving as a police officer 
to my problematic substance use and to where I am today and what brings me here today. And if I look back, when I joined the police, you know, I believed in what I did, that I was there to serve and protect and that the law was to be abided by. You know, the letter of the law stood and that was very clear to me. And this led me to arresting and targeting people for drug offences. In my community, they were causing all the problems, uh, whether they were using, dealing or committing crime to finance their habit. It was very much black and white. And these individuals, they were either weak, they had no willpower or no motivation to get a proper, honest job. And that they needed to take responsibility for their actions and that arresting and criminalising them would serve them right, as they would learn. And I, you know, I had judged them completely. Never did I imagine that years later I would be in the same position of being arrested and locked in a police cell. And that I would feel intensely the stigma, the shame and humiliation of somebody with a problematic substance use issue and not knowing what to do about it. And today I realise, looking back, that I wasn't locking up dangerous criminals. Many of them were just people that were ill, they needed help, support, treatment. And they were often a product of the society that had let them down and ignored them and cast them aside. And I remember that feeling, I still get to me, <coughs> coming around in a police cell, piecing together what had I done, how had I got here, you know, and thinking, you know, this isn't what I thought my life was going to be. You know, this wasn't a career choice when I was at school. You know, and that overwhelming feeling that I can't do this anymore, but I don't know how not to. And despite all the negative consequences, I would leave the police station again to do it all again. You know, when I look back and I can see how crazy that looks to an average person, but when you're in the depths of this illness, trying to find a way out, failing over and over again, the solution to me was death. That would be easier. And the shame of it is just is, is, is too much to bear. So I didn't know what was wrong with me. You know, that, that was the really hard thing I, I didn't know. I thought I was completely alone and I didn't know where or who to go to speak to. I didn't, all I did know was that society judged me, stigmatised me and made me feel more ashamed. That it told me I was a bad person that had failed on all moral fronts. And I didn't need that, I knew that already. That there was something fundamentally wrong with me especially as a mother who couldn't stop using for her children. I did get recovery and I got that from being shown empathy and compassion from those who, like me, couldn't stop using alcohol or other drugs despite all their negative consequences. I was shown that I could actually live and be okay without them. Now, it wasn't easy. It's the hardest work I've ever had to do. And I am indebted to those who did listen reached out their hand and gave me space to speak without judgment. But it shouldn't be so hard. You know, it shouldn't be so hard to access support, services, treatment, or the simplest of actions to create a space in order to talk about it. The biggest barriers, especially if you're working with institutions like the police, is stigma and shame. This is an illness that is stigma and shame based. And what I know about shame is everybody has it, we're all afraid to talk about it, and the less we talk about it, the more it controls our lives. And like I said, I can still feel that shame about what I did, and that I believed I was a bad person, I was flawed and unworthy of love and belonging, and I was so much pain that I had to numb it all. The problem with numbing, it also means I missed out on all joy, love or worthiness that is out there, of all the connections and we all need connection. As human beings, we're hardwired for connection. But I do hope that some of you somewhere will hear this and maybe change their view of people who have problematic substance use and take the courage to talk, to talk about it. It's not selective. It's not a lifestyle choice. Everyone will know somebody who has it. You might not know that fact about them, but someone you know will have it. It's a family illness. And when one person suffers, everybody suffers. 
and we hide it well. Families hide it well. Society and stigma makes us do that until it's often too late. And in large institutions where we literally put our armour on, our uniforms, it acts as a barrier, not just out of on patrol, but back at the police station, seeing the uniform first and the human secondary. So I ask that we stop dehumanising people, that we are in this world together, and let's start being more open and talk about it, to have those awkward, awkward conversations, take away the stigma, and that we are all in this together. Thank you. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Uh, I've got a broadcast message. Maybe it's faster than uh, my typing to Diane uh, from Switzerland. If you can register as a panelist with the link we sent, uh, we'll have some, some remarks from the floor in a few minutes. Meantime, Matt, can you share the results of the first poll? That's fairly convincing numbers. And so I'm grateful to the 12% of people that don't know anybody. So we know it's not everywhere, but 88% is a pretty large number on the panel here. Uh, Matt, do you have another question to queue up? And then I'm going to reach out to uh, Diane and see if we can get her registered here. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody. Sorry, I'm just doing a few technical things. Um, I want to thank our other panelists. In a few moments, we're going to go to a discussion time frame, and we have a request from the floor uh, for some comments from the government of Switzerland, and we'll, we'll be getting that as soon as we figure out the logistics there. Uh, in the meantime, um, I just want to say a few things. Uh, for now, and I guess we could have had a panel with nurses. We could have had a panel from the legal society. We could have had a panel from the judiciary. We could have had a panel of homeless people. We could have had a panel from racialized community. A number of panels we could have had with the same message. And there wasn't any space. There was a lot of judgment. There's nobody I could talk to. Nobody seemed to understand, including myself. That I heard people that we loved and we heard ourselves and that we were disappointing. I also want to be clear that most people that use substances aren't having these experiences, you know? And so that's why they're out around the world, lots of people use substances for personal enjoyment that adds to their lives. And so they are often caught in this stigma as well. And just want to recognize that piece. But for those of us who have a substance use disorder, it has compounded because their behaviors seem to make true of that and what others think of us that we don't care. More factual part is the part of us that cares has lost control about the part of us 
that must have beliefs, we must have access if we must have. And so a place of safety to have those conversations highly needed. And uh, it seems to me that uh, policing is one of those things that's most reached out there. So let's turn it over to the chat room for the attendees now uh, and, and see if there's any questions here. I saw some comments earlier. Anybody has any questions? Now's the time to put it in the chat box. Oh, there we go. Uh, question for Joe. As someone who is interested in becoming a police officer, I understand how important for your situation it was that the organization was there to help you and your fellow officers. Well, what about people who are homeless who are struggling with the same issues? How do you recognize recommend we can help them as a society. Oh, if you want to comment. Yeah, to echo what Gord just said, it doesn't matter what your background is or where you come from. We have to recognize this as a universal issue. Something about us, and I mean, Suzanne mentioned it too with the shame piece, that we all hold that shame. We're all responsible for stigmatizing. Uh, we're all responsible for doing it. I did it too. I mentioned in my, in my uh, speech earlier, I worked a pretty difficult beat. And I remember one beat that I had, to, I did it for three years right before I entered a world of recovery. And I said that I saw a lot of the parallels between um, um, the people I was dealing with in the streets and myself. Prior to that, I came from this, uh, I was trained in this war on drugs that Diane mentioned, us versus them. You enforce, if you see somebody with a drug problem, well, there's laws in place that you can now use to enforce them out of that problem. So the idea is that you need this humanistic approach. We all need to look at each other and see the human in each one of us, regardless of the background of where we are, whether you're wearing a police uniform or whether you are a marginalized community or you're from poverty. And we need to have a, a spirit of selfless service to each other. Um, and that's a core issue we all need to start to look at for ourselves, self-reflection about how you operate in the world as a person. And if you're bringing people closer to recovery that need it, or if you're bringing them farther away, I hope that answers your question. Thanks very much, Joe. And we have a question for Suzanne. What was the hardest part about asking for help with, for your addiction as a parent? Um, the hardest part. God, that's such a hard question for me. The um, being a parent and being a, a mother is one of the hardest jobs in the world. And I constantly had that shame of not being enough, not being good enough, even though my substance use meant that I wasn't present, you know. Um, and it's the, sh it's the shame, the shame of admitting that I couldn't cope with life. I, I, I couldn't cope with being a parent. I needed help and support and who to go to that wouldn't judge me. Um, and that stopped me, that stopped me going to the doctors, that stopped me talking to other people um, until for me, my consequences were that I was homeless um, and I had nowhere to go. And I ended up getting um, help from 12-step program. Um, I wish I had the courage to have done it much sooner, um, but again, it was at the time I didn't know who to go to, um, and it was sort of by coincidence I ended up in a in an AA room, not knowing what the hell was going on, and and I didn't want to be there. And even in that room, I judged other people because I wasn't that bad, but I became that bad because. Um, I was in that cycle until I had a light bulb moment. Um, so what I would take to anyone is that it, it's take the courage to reach out and ask for help from doctors, professionals, whatever's available to you. And for me, AA saved my life. Thanks, 
Thanks, Diane. Uh, we've got uh, another survey uh, results back. We'll just take a look, a quick look at those. Okay. Uh, I have to say, when I see that, uh, we saw 86% 80, of uh, people had knew someone who'd experienced stigma or had experienced stigma themselves, but 99% believe and we need to do something about it. And so that's what allies are all about. You don't have to necessarily have experienced the harm or know a friend who experienced the harm to care for other people. And I'm really glad to see that level of response. It's also very optimistic and very empowering because what it says is there's something to be done. And so I'm really encouraged by that. And um, I want to introduce Ms. Diane Stibber, literally from Switzerland with some comments from the floor. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you very much, Chair, for giving me the floor and my apologies for the technical issues that I was having. Um, connections between illicit substances and police officers um, typically reported by the media concern uh, detection, confiscation of illicit substances or accidental exposure to fentanyl or even the deployment of naloxone in cases of uh, overdose. As a result of their unique occupation, and that you've been mentioning, uh, thank you very much to the panelists, police officers face a great deal of stress and trauma, much more regularly so than the general population does. In addition to the potential uh, physical harm in their line of duty, officers witness uh, traumatic or disturbing events and also experience stress related to the role that they're playing uh, in society. All of these elements contribute to significant overall stress factors that can result uh, in substance use um, problems. So while police officers work uh, on the front lines of the drug uh, situation, little if any attention is paid to the potential for police officers to develop and systems, uh, substance use related disorders themselves and the related stigma they and their families may face. Switzerland would therefore like to thank the organizers of this side event, Canada, for bringing up this important issue, because only if we are aware of who experiences stigma and where can we actually counter it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diane. We're open for a couple more questions. What I think we have then is uh, a great group of panelists who've had a, done a wonderful job conveying a very important message and such clarity that there's few questions. And I think part of that is in that answer of 99% of the attendees believe in there's something that can be done and something that should be done. And so I wanna take this opportunity again, thanks Suzanne, Joe and Diane and Peter for joining us. Uh, and if you make a few closing comments myself on behalf of CAPSA and uh, our compassionate approach to helping others. Uh, and I guess we want to begin by thanking countries that sponsored this event and the United Nations Organization, Organization of Drug and Crimes, who are also a sponsorship. Health Canada in particular and the Government of Canada for helping with the arrangements and for supporting us and being here. In the end, um, policies are developed from conversations and from unrest and, and from the need to change. The more that we can have these conversations, the more that we'll understand that we're not talking about others and we're not talking about them, we're talking about us and it's a very big us. Throughout the world, people are suffering from stigma and discrimination in relationship to drug use, and drug use problems and substance use disorders. I hope in some way that we've been able to move that forward and that uh, you'll feel better about having these conversations. 
I know it's obvious that uh, the attendees here feel strongly about stigma and the need to address it and to use person first language. And uh, for any more information on that or contact CAPSA directly, www.capsa.ca. And uh, LEAP is out there as well. And Diane, uh, if you want to just give us coordinates to find LEAP. Sure, if we're at uh, lawenforcementaction.org and I will put it in the uh, chat as well. Thank you very much, Gord. Thanks everybody. And I guess the other thing is we've had a, close to 100 attendees and I'm curious about their stories and I'm curious about what they could share to open this conversation. And uh, feel free to write us at info at capsa.ca and get involved. Uh, we can certainly use your voice and use your help. And we're gonna end on time. And I think that'll surprise just about everybody, including myself. Check the question box one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>